Can you hear me? I dragged it after today's here. Well, it's good for you, yeah, yeah that's I, right. I don't know what you're wearing. It's very <laughs> Testing, testing, do you hear me?
Final test. One, two, three. Do you hear me? Last check, one, two, three.
Quorum being present, the subcommittee will come to order. Good afternoon and welcome to today's subcommittee hearing. I'd like to thank our witness, David Sateslo, Assistant Secretary of Labor for Mine, Safety, and Health, and our members for joining today's important discussion regarding the policies and priorities of the U.S. Department of Labor's Mine, Safety, and Health Administration, and for all of us in Washington that live by acronyms, that's MSHA. Mining is not only essential for America's homes and businesses, it is an essential industry for our economy. This is an industry that literally keeps the lights on, and it deserves our gratitude. Workers in the mining industry have been the unsung heroes of the American economy, and thanks to President Trump, many Americans are being reminded of how much we rely on miners on a daily basis. In 2017, more than 319,000 Americans were employed by the mining industry, and we must ensure that they have a safe and healthful workplace. We ask so much of these hardworking Americans, and vital policies are in place to provide them with the safest environment possible. <coughs> For the federal government, this task falls on MSHA. Created by the Federal Mine Safety and Health Act of 1977, it is the duty of MSHA to establish and enforce regulations governing all mining activities, both above and below ground. Of course, safety is very important to the mining industry as well, and we commend the large majority of law-abiding companies in the industry who do the right thing. Mine safety remains a major priority for this committee, and we are particularly interested in how the federal government is regulating the mining industry to ensure the highest standards of safety while also allowing the industry to innovate for the benefit of mine workers and the American economy. Among other issues, today's hearing will examine the regulatory agenda of MSHA and how MSHA intends to work with all industry stakeholders to promote the best possible policies and practices that protect mine workers and encourage economic growth. Unfortunately, this was not always the stance of MSHA in recent years. America has seen a new age of innovation and enthusiasm in the mining industry. The Trump administration has made clear that it will promote policies that recognize the economic importance of the mining industry, and this committee intends to play a key role in these efforts. Congress will continue to work with all of the relevant stakeholders in order to create and promote policies that improve the safety and overall strength of the mining industry. We urge this administration as we did the prior administration, to hold bad actors accountable. Let me say that again. We want this administration, as we wanted the last administration, to hold bad actors accountable. At the same time, MSHA should direct its focus towards a more collaborative approach with the mining industry to address worker safety. The American mining industry plays a major role in driving the American economy and will continue to do so. We look forward to hearing from Assistant Secretary Zetezolo, who I should add is a former miner himself, so we don't have to tell him about worker safety. In order to understand the current state of workplace safety within the industry and what can be done to strengthen American mining and protect the safety of mine workers, I will now yield to Ranking Member Takano for his opening remarks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you for holding this hearing today on mine safety. Uh, the last time this committee held a mine safety hearing was nearly two and a half years ago, and there are a number of urgent issues that need to be addressed. Today, the Journal of the American Medical Association, JAMA, published an article documenting the single largest cluster of advanced black lung cases ever reported in the medical literature. The National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health otherwise known as NIOSH, verified 416 cases of progressive massive fibrosis, or PMF, in three small black lung clinics in southwest Virginia. And researchers, and researchers believe that there are even more cases yet to be verified. Moreover, this report left out wide swaths of Appalachian mining communities that are likely affected as well. If we could see uh, slide one of black lung images, please. It's behind you. Uh, PMF 
or progressive massive fibrosis is a debilitating and often fatal disease. The three pictures displayed on the screen illustrate the gravity of this health condition. The photo on the left shows a normal healthy lung. The photo in the center shows the lung of a minor with black lung disease. This lung has coal nodules embedded throughout. A minor with this level of disease would have great difficulty breathing. Now the photo on the right shows the lung of a minor with PMF. The lung is filled with large masses of dense black tissue. A minor with PMF would find it nearly impossible to walk across this hearing room. Without a lung transplant, this condition is a death warrant. Even a lung transplant, without, with even a lung transplant, it would only add a few years to that minor's life. As you can see, I want to go to slide two. Uh, as you can see on this chart, the documented cases of PMF have been on the rise since the late 1990s. And what we are witnessing today is a health crisis that requires an immediate response. I hope we will hear what the Assistant Secretary plans to do about this documented surge in PMF cases. It's clear that this cannot be solved by rolling back rules that protect minors, including MSHA's respirable dust rule. April 5th of this year marks the eighth anniversary of the Upper Big Branch mine explosion, which took the lives of 29 miners in America's worst coal mine disaster in 40 years. The cause, according to numerous investigative reports and a criminal trial, was the reckless conduct of Massey Energy's corporate executives who consistently put coal production ahead of safety. The tools that MSHA could use to hold Massey and other rogue miners accountable were rendered ineffective. This committee heard testimony from coal miners, mine inspectors, mine engineers, agency officials, and the families of the Upper Big Branch miners about specific weaknesses in the Mine Act that needed to be remedied. The majority said we should wait on legislating until all of the investigative reports had come in. The last of the six reports was completed in February of 2012. But still, the committee has been unwilling to move even one of the dozens of recommended reforms. Let me highlight three of these, of these key reforms, which are in the Robert C. Byrd Mine Safety Protection Act of 2017, otherwise known as H.R. 1903. It was introduced by ranking member Bobby Scott. First, this act provides MSHA with subpoena power, subpoena authority to conduct inspections and investigations. An agency whose mission is protecting minors <coughs> from serious injury or death needs this basic tool of subpoena authority. Second, it authorizes a felony a sanction for criminal violations of the Mine Act. The current sanction is a misdemeanor. Federal judges and prosecutors, as well as editorial pages across coal country, have criticized the misdemeanor sanctions as wholly inadequate to deter the most egregious conduct. Third, this act would codify the pattern of violations regulations adopted by MSHA. This addresses the small subset of mine operators who systematically violate safety standards. Pattern of violations has a history that dates back to the chairmanship of Carl Perkins, whose portrait we see right up there, and who conducted the hearings that are in this, uh, uh, in this transcript. And he was responsible for the passage of the 1977 Mine Act, which created the Mine Safety and Health Administration, MSHA. In 1976, following two successive explosions at the Scotia Mine that took the lives of 23 miners, and, seven, and three federal mine inspectors, Congress learned that the mine had been ordered closed 110 times in the six years prior to the explosion, and regulators issued 420 safety and health violations in the two years prior to the explosion. Repeated citations were not an adequate deterrent. Congress included in the 1977 Mine Act the pattern of violation sanction 
which gives MSHA an additional tool to rein in serial violators who systematically disregard the safety of their mines. Once on this sanction, each and every time there is a significant and serious violation, operators must withdraw miners from the mine until the violation is corrected. Unless a mine remains free from significant and serious violations for 90 days, it cannot be removed from this sanction. This provision of law was not implemented for 33 years, according to the Inspector General, because of loopholes in the implementing regulations. MSHA finally plugged these loopholes in 2013 following the Upper Big Branch disaster. In 2014, Murray Energy, the Ohio Coal Association, and the Kentucky Coal Association sued to overturn MSHA's 2013 rule. Following a change in the administration, these plaintiffs sought settlement discussions. Assistant Secretary Zetazalo, who has joined us today, previously chaired both the Ohio Coal Association and the Kentucky Coal Association. I have serious questions about whether the Assistant Secretary can have any role in these settlement negotiations. At a minimum, I would say there is an appearance of a, con of a conflict of interest, which highlights the need for a transparency in the closed door negotiations with the plaintiffs. I want to thank the Secretary for appearing here today, and I welcome his testimony. I look forward to hearing it. Thank you. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Cano. Pursuant to Committee Rule 7C, all subcommittee members will be permitted to submit written statements to be included in the permanent hearing record. Without objection, the hearing record will remain open for 14 days to allow statements, questions for the records, and other extraneous material referenced during the hearing to be submitted in the official hearing record. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's witness. Mr. David Zetezolo is the Assistant Secretary of Labor for Mine Safety and Health at the U.S. Department of Labor. Mr. Zatezalo began his career as a union mine worker and rose to the ranks to become Vice President of Operations and Chief Executive Officer of Rhino Resources, a coal mining company based in Lexington, Kentucky. Mr. Zatezalo, if you would please raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Let the record reflect the witness answered in the affirmative. Now, before I recognize you to provide your testimony, let me briefly explain our lighting system. You will have five minutes to present your testimony. When you begin, the light in front of you will turn green. When one minute is left, the light will turn yellow. When your time has expired, the light will turn red. At that point, I ask you to wrap up your remarks as best as you are able. Now, I'm not going to be a strict dictator up here, but as quickly as you can, wrap up. And after you've testified, members will each have five minutes to ask questions. So now, sir, we recognize you for five minutes for your testimony. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, Chairman Byrne, Ranking Member Takano, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for inviting me here to testify today. It's my honor to appear before this subcommittee and to represent President Trump, Secretary Acosta, and all 2032 dedicated safety professionals of the Department of Labor's Mine Safety and Health Administration. Mine safety is not a partisan issue. MSHA's mission is straightforward and pure, to prevent death, illness, and injury from mining, and to promote safe, safe and healthful work practices for our nation's miners. I believe the key to fulfilling MSHA's mission is collaboration. As the members here know, MSHA's work and workforce lies largely outside the Beltway. To lead this organization effectively, I believe it is crucial for me to examine the entire organization and build those collaborative relationships with the dedicated professionals out in the field. Accordingly, I'm in the process of visiting all 15 mining district offices and four remote program area offices across the country to hear their insight on ways to improve MSHA's operations. MSHA promotes safety and health through inspections, enforcement, outreach, education, and compliance assistance. At the heart of MSHA's enforcement efforts are the statutorily mandated inspections we conduct, the so-called twos and fours, 
to inspect all surface mines twice per year and also underground mines four times per year for the approximately 13,000 active U.S. mines in the United States. I'm pleased to report that in 2017, MSHA fulfilled this mandate. Additionally, in 2017, MSHA inspections resulted in 105,000 citations and orders for conditions observed during 42,219 inspections. MSHA saw 28 mining fatalities, and while the loss of a single life is one too many, this was the second lowest number ever recorded and only the third year in MSHA's history that fatalities dropped below 30. MSHA will use all available tools across both sectors to protect the safety and health of our nation's miners. Specifically, MSHA will pay particular attention to powered haulage, which constituted 43% of all fatalities in 2017. I'd also like to update you on MSHA's corrective actions with regard to medical standards for its inspectors. MSHA personnel who perform regular duties in mines must be physically able to operate without posing a direct threat to themselves or others. Last year, Secretary Acosta was made aware that approximately 15% of inspectors and technical personnel did not meet medical standards. And the percentage had been increasing for several years. Accordingly, Secretary Acosta directed MSHA to remediate this issue. MSHA has since completed all 224 exams and all but 10 cases have been resolved at this time. In 2018, MSHA will be introducing a modernized inspection application system in the field. This system will provide our inspectors with lightweight, ruggedized tablets and digital tools that will improve data accuracy and capture enhanced data as they record their findings. I expect the rollout to begin by mid-February and conclude within a few months. The modernization effort is important work and long overdue, however, data alone does not improve mining safety. Used in conjunction with the enhanced data collection system, compliance assistance provides MSHA with the ability to identify trends and the flexibility to focus resources accordingly. I believe that a compliance assistance, especially for small mine operators, is an effective strategy to ensure increased compliance with the mandatory safety and health standards. MSHA district enforcement officials work closely with the educational field and small mine services department to identify industry needs and to help address the conditions and hazards specific to their mines. I look forward to working with MSHA's career personnel, Secretary Acosta, and members of this committee to continue to build upon MSHA's 40 years of success. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. I look forward to answering any questions. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, we now have members ask you questions. And we will start by recognizing the distinguished chairwoman of the committee, General Lady from North Carolina, Ms. Fox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mr. Secretary, for being here. We continue to hear that enforcement consistency is a problem at MSHA. For example, one inspector sees a hazard and prescribes fixes in order for the mine operator to avoid future citations. Another inspector arrives and in the same work area finds fault with the abatement and issues a different directive requiring additional efforts to address these concerns. How do you intend to address this problem of inconsistency among the inspectors? Madam Chairwoman, there's, there are a number of ways we can address this, and, and we have already begun addressing this. The first one is through communications, communications between the mining districts, communications with the Beckley Training Center, in some cases putting out advisories on, in particular, conveyor guarding on how that should be interpreted and uh, how we should react to that. Communications is really the key to eliminate inconsistency. That, along with education, you know, we have a very fine mine academy in Beckley, West Virginia. Our people are trained there regularly, and as we have the opportunity to conduct that, those classes, we are able to make sure that everybody is on the same page and doing the same things. That, along with uh, my visits and my staff visits to the mining districts, I think 
we can get a lot more consistent than some of the things have been in the past. It, it is important that there be one MSHA and not, you know, as, as we have 15 different mining districts, uh, we don't need 15 different mining MSHAs. So we, we try, we're working very hard to make sure that everybody has the same message. And that's all I know to do, ma'am. Thanks, and if you educate them instead of train them, it might help a little bit too. It's hard to believe that until 2007, the iPhone didn't exist. Now it's hard to imagine a world without smartphones. The pace of technology in this century has been truly astounding. Could you discuss how technology has changed the mining industry, and do you believe MSHA has appropriately incorporated technological advances? And I want to tell you, I've heard some of the comments related to this myself from people in the industry. Communications technologies is, is one of the keys. It's one of the key areas where we are trying to catch up, especially in regard to our new EMSIS uh, campaign and getting our inspectors on the more current equipment. Safety-wise, there are numerous upgrades uh, through the technology upgrades and through the development of some autonomous vehicles, those sorts of things that have broad application for the mining industry. The entire proximity uh, detection systems are all as a result of newer technology. They're all as a result of being able to take advantage of that technology to go further. We continue to pursue that. We will continue to pursue that. There are, there are technological improvements out there that need to be made. Thank you. One more, um, one more question. Um, most of the time when we think about mining, we think about coal mining. Yes, but in 2017, there were almost 10 times more metal, non-metal mines and coal mines in operation. The number of workers in metal, non-metal mines was nearly 240,000 in 2017 versus nearly 83,000 in coal mines. Are you taking a different approach to strategies for protecting coal miners versus metal, non-metal miners? And relatedly, as you consider resource allocation for MSHA and use of its enforcement personnel, what factors are you taking into account as you develop these strategies? Thank you. We, we are trying to take advantage of changes in that demographic, if you would, of the mining industry. There are approximately 10 metal, non-metal mines for every coal mine in the country. Historically, you know, as a former miner myself, I can tell you that MSHA has been typically viewed as a coal-centric organization. As we go forward, it has to be viewed more as a mining-centric organization. There are certain areas where uh, geographically it is to MSHA and the country's benefit to blur the line of distinction, if you would, between metal, non-metal, and coal. Uh, several examples come to mind, and I'll be happy to cover those if you wish. Thank you. My time is up. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairman. The chair now recognizes the distinguished ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Scott, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, as ranking member Takano stated earlier, the Journal of American Medical, the Journal of the American Medical Association published an article today that verified 416 cases of progressive massive fibrosis, or PMF, in three small black lung clinics in southwest Virginia. This is the largest single cluster of advanced black lung cases ever documented. Researchers at the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, the NIOSH, conceded that this is an underestimate, and of course, that's only one state. The rate of PMF has been surging since 2000 and has spiked far higher than rates found in the country in the early 1970s. Each case of advanced black lung disease is an entirely preventable tragedy and represents mine operators' unwillingness to, to adequately control mine dust exposures and safety regulators' failure to set, monitor, and enforce standards necessary to protect miners. Uh, Miosh cannot keep looking the other way while the burden of this preventable disease grows. An investigation by the National Public Radio in 2016 reported that there are 10 times as many as PMF cases as those reported by NIOSH. 
In response, Senator Casey and I ask HHS and DOL to undertake a full accounting of the number of known cases of advanced black lung disease, and today's report is the first installment in that effort. In addition, my colleague from Southwest Virginia, Congressman Morgan Griffith, and I held roundtables with coal miners and visited an underground coal mine together. We are seeking increased funding for black lung clinics uh, to better assist the influx of miners with PMF and to support the clinic's work in quantifying the extent of this epidemic. The likely culprit, according to experts, is the increasing amount of silica exposure from mines cutting rock mixed with coal. Uh, current technology does not exist to provide real-time silica monitoring. Real-time monitoring only exists for coal mine dust, but NIOSH has developed an end-of-shift monitoring technology for silica, which, if required, could improve compliance. The adequacy of the exposure limits is another question which we need to, do, to address, particularly since OSHA's standard is one half of that of MSHA. Now, my first question, Mr. DeCesolo, is uh, what is your plan to require mine operators to deploy end-of-shift silica monitoring technology uh, developed by NIOSH? Sir, end-of-shift silica monitoring, we currently do by way of the gravimetric sampling, uh, and we analyze those whenever that, when they are of sufficient size. And how widespread is that monitoring? That monitoring is across the coal industry, sir. Thank you. Um, now, are you aware that Minch's silica exposure limit is twice the level allowed by OSHA? I have been made aware of that, yes, sir. Uh, what is your plan to do anything about that? The, the plan to limit silica exposure started in 2014 when the respirable dust limits were dropped from 2.0 milligrams per cubic meter 1.5 milligrams per cubic meter. And, and let me add that black lung is a terrible disease. I know people with black lung, and it is something that is very preventable and should be eliminated. Along that case, we have recently dropped the standard in beginning in August of 2014 to 1.5 milligram. I'm pleased to report that generally those samples are coming back in compliance or even below with that. MSHA's own sampling and analysis has shown that to be the case. We think that uh, the 1.5 milligram standard uh, will be a great benefit to this. However, this is something that needs further study, especially given the uh, generally accepted 10-year latency period between exposure and development of the black lung disease. Given that latency period, a change from August of 2014 is not necessarily reflected, especially in a study that began in January of 2013. I don't mean to cut you off, but I had one, one quick question, and that yes, is that the administration's regulatory agenda lists retrospective review of Minch's 2014 respir respirable dust uh, rule. It's listed as deregulation um, not just a simple neutral review. Do you plan to roll back any aspect of the 2014 respirable dust rule? I do not. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Scott. I now recognize myself for five minutes. Mr. Secretary, we have heard that the training assistance initiative undertaken by MSHA in June of 2017 was very beneficial for everyone, mine owners and miners alike. The initiative also brought awareness to the data that has shown less experienced miners, especially those with one year of experience or less, have higher injury rates. I have two questions related to this data. Do you view the Training Assistant Initiative as successful? And second, will you consider launching similar initiatives in the future? Relative to whether I view it as uh, successful, you know, based although I cannot quantify that based on the feedback that I received from operators as well as miners that I know throughout the industry, uh, generally people are in favor, favor of it and they feel it's, it's good for inspectors to be able to have one-on-one -on -one time with individuals as they operate. So from that aspect, yes, I'd say it is successful. Uh, the Compliance Assistance Program was started 
last year, and it has since been refined to where we try to spend extra time with people who have less than one year's worth of work experience and extra time with people who have been on a new job for less than one year. So from those aspects, I think it has been successful, sir, although I, c I could not quantify that with numbers today. Are you considering doing something like that in the future or something similar? Yes, sir. As, as we identify trends in accidents, one of the areas that we'll probably be going to this year is more individual compliance assistance in the way of powered haulage because we had a disproportionate increase in powered haulage fatalities last year, it's obviously an area that we need to focus in. So we're trying to use the compliance assistance program based off of the accidents that we've had and use that program to target areas that need more individual attention. Your background as a coal miner certainly gives you an interesting perspective. Tell us how your experience has informed your views on the role of MSHA and what MSHA should do in promoting safety and health as compared to the role private industry does? Well, sir, I started in coal mining in 1974, in May of 1974, before MSHA was officially an agency. Uh, started as a union employee on a midnight shift and uh, learned very early on that you had to pay attention to what you were doing because you had to do that and you had to pay attention to what the people around you were doing because that was important. Uh, you are your brother's keeper when you're a coal miner. You have to look out for each other all the time. MSHA's role has been critical and very important in the progression of mine safety. If you, you can look at any hit chart, any history of mine safety and see that it has improved over time. It's something that that diligence, especially with some of the previous secretaries, is something to build off of because it needs to improve even further. Uh, while, while fatalities have greatly reduced, we have not been able to realize uh, the gains across the board. And uh, until such time as we don't have to worry about fatalities and we tell ourselves that we've done that great, when that gets to zero, then and I'll be happy, but the lessons I've learned is that it takes continual diligence, one step at a time, one examination at a time, one monitor at a time, that's what it takes to make this work. You know, when I, when I took the role at MSHA, I said that I would enforce the Mine Act, and I will. And in some places, we might have to do more than enforce the Mine Act, because that's what it takes. You know, we have to continue to work with people. We are, we're in the people business. And these people are my people. They're people that I've worked with my whole life, and I want to see them all do well. So. Well, the committee appreciates your perspective on that, and your, your background certainly puts you in a great, good position to do that. Uh, we hope that you will let us know what we can do to help you as you go forward into your service. I know you're relatively new to your position, but yes, sir. as you go through, you and your staff identify things. You need to let us know what we can do to help you in legislation or otherwise. Mm -hmm. Thanks, with that, I represent the uh, ranking member of the subcommittee, my colleague, Mr. Cano, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Secretary Zatello, uh, the maximum penalty for a mine operator who willfully violates mine safety standards and kills 29 miners is a mere misdemeanor. We saw that limitation in the Mine Act play out in the sentencing of CEO Don Blankenship in the aftermath of the Upper Big Branch mine disaster. The judge was limited to a misdemeanor sanction. Now, Mr. Secretary, uh, is a misdemeanor an adequate deterrent for operators who willfully violate mine safety standards and recklessly endanger the life of miners? Congressman, my, my role at MSHA is to enforce the laws as they exist. I do not interpret them. I am an enforcement person. I'm not asking and, you to interpret if, them. I'm, ask, if, I'm asking you, if, sir, to offer your judgment about whether or not uh, an operator who willfully violates a mine safety standard and kills multiple people, whether a misdemeanor is an adequate sanction. Defined in the Mine Act, sir. It's defined in the Mine Act. I'm not asking, I know it's in the Mine Act, but I'm asking you, Mr. Secretary, for your judgment. I, I, 
have always believed my entire life, sir, that punishments should fit crimes. That is not for me to set punishments. It's only for me to work within the system that is provided. Well, in your view, should the Mine Act be amended to provide a felony penalty for the most egregious cases? That's a good question for Congress, sir. Okay, well, thank you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, Secretary Zatello, in 2014, Murray Energy, the Ohio Coal Association, and the Kentucky Coal Association sued MSHA to nullify the agency's two, uh, 2013 patterns of violation regulations. Now, you were a director and chairman of both the Ohio and Kentucky Coal Association associations not long ago, and after the Trump administration took office, the plaintiffs asked to enter into settlement discussions with the Department of Labor and MSHA under a sue and uh, uh, settle strategy. Se Mr. Secretary, what was the date you ceased to serve on the boards of each of these coal associations that sued MSHA? I ceased to serve on the Ohio Coal Association board in 2008, and I do not remember the exact date, I'm sorry. And I ceased to be uh, in the Kentucky Coal Association in 2014. Uh, what is the... I'm sorry, I don't remember the exact date. Yeah, but more or less. Uh, uh, what is the status of the settlement discussions with the plaintiffs? The settlement discussions are uh, still ongoing. They have not, uh, I have been briefed only one time uh, for a few short minutes about the situation. There have not been any settlement discussions to my knowledge since the time that I came with him, sure. So have you participated in any of the settlement discussions to date? No, sir. Okay, thank you. Do you see a potential conflict where you are sitting down to negotiate on behalf of MSHA with two organizations which you led not very long ago? I do not, sir. Okay. Um, if, if, there, if there is a conflict, I'm happy to work with the Ethics Council. Okay, so I my don't next question is I had no involvement in either of those actions. Well, would, would that include uh, uh, recusing yourself from the negotiations? If, if that's the advice of Ethics Council? I see, all right. Um, beyond, beyond, I mean, you don't think that uh, uh, the, beyond ethics, uh, consulting the Ethics Council that uh, you find any reason to recuse yourself in the negotiations? No, sir. Okay, thank you. Mr. Secretary, is MSHA's crystalline silica exposure level sufficiently protective? That's difficult to say. It certainly needs some more work, certainly needs some more study. Uh, we are currently awaiting some guidance, I hope, from the National Academy of Sciences who's conducting a retrospective study on black lung. Included in that black lung study is also a study with some silica, although it's not primarily a silica study. Do you, so do you, we have, you know, I have stated before that I agree to be guided by that study. Well, you are aware that MSHA's silica exposure limit is twice the level allowed by OSHA and that uh, NIOSH has recommended that MSHA reduce uh, exposure limits by half. You are aware I, of that? I have been told that, yes, sir. Uh, and do you have anything to say about that? I mean, do you agree with that? What I agree with is that it needs reviewed further. Currently, our samples show that silica exposure levels are far less than that. All right, so you, you, you're, you are, rejecting, are you rejecting OSHA and, and NIOSH recommendations? I am not rejecting that. I am saying that what is right for OSHA is not necessarily right for MSHA. MSHA so you're rejecting is it for a very different agency. So you're rejecting I'm it for rejecting MSHA. Rejecting the universality of that across the world. I take it you're rejecting it for MSHA. No, sir. I didn't say that. I said I believe it needs more further study. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I my time is up. Thank you, Mr. Connell. The chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from Georgia, Ms. Handel, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Assistant Secretary Zatesilo, for being here. Um, real quickly, the uh, committee focuses a lot on the impact of regulations on small businesses and 
clearly there is a very big difference between a small mine operator and the challenges that that entity would face versus the larger ones. In your testimony, you mentioned that there are about 50 employees across MSHA dedicated to the Compliance Assistance and Education Initiative. Do you think that there's a right balance currently at MSHA um, and priority for compliance education and assistance for small mines versus the larger mines? And could you talk about that? Your question is, do I think that we have the right mix between the two? Yes. I, Are your priorities between small mines and larger mines, do you have the right balance there? We, we, as we go forward in the future, we will probably require a greater number of people in the small mines because more and more of the mines are smaller mines. I think it's about right right now. All right. Um, anything that you think would need to be different in terms of the actual programming of compliance, education, and assistance? Yes, I, I have not uh, completed all the visitations that I'd like to, especially with our Beckley Academy. Uh, I'm very anxious to get their input and understand where they think they can help. Uh, we have a good facility with a lot of good people there. Uh, small mines are one of our priorities and they will remain such. Great, thank you. Um, and one um, other question. You mentioned in your testimony that you were visiting the various mining district offices across the country. Yes, when you do these visits, um, what's the primary message that you take to the personnel in these district offices and what have been some of the top takeaways that you have from those visits? Uh, my, my top message is that uh, the role of MSHA will not change. The role of MSHA is vital, it's honorable, and it's something we need to continue to pursue with the diligence. Uh, some of the key takeaways is that I've been amazed really at how many really good qualified people and how dedicated safety professionals we have throughout the agency. Uh, their amount of concern for what goes on within the industry. So. Great. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Handel. The chair now recognizes the gentlewoman from North Carolina, my fellow co-chair of the Historically Black College and University Caucus, Ms. Adams. For five thank minutes. you, Mr. Chair, and um, thank you very much, Mr. Secretary, for being here. Um, you, entrust, you are entrusted with ensuring the safety of all minors nationwide, and it's my view that our minor safety should be the Mine Safety and Health Administration's number one priority. Yes, In fact, when the Federal Mine Safety and Health Act was enacted, Congress made clear that the first priority and concern of all uh, in the coal and other mining industry must be the health and safety of its most precious resource, the miner, and that the existence of unsafe and un unhealthful conditions and practices in the nation's coal or other mines is, is a serious impediment to the future growth uh, of the coal or other mining industry and cannot be tolerated. These words actually come from the Act's preamble. Uh, so with that in mind and in recognition of a growing problem, your predecessor uh, finalized the respiratory dust rule to help combat the menace that is black lung disease. However, the Department of Labor's uh, fall 2017 regulatory agenda for MSHA listed two deregulatory actions, item one, requested recommendations to streamline or replace uh, MSHA's existing standards and regulations. And item two called for a retrospective view of MSHA's uh, respiratory dust rule, which was adopted in 2014 uh, to help reduce the incidence of black lung, lung disease. So with regards to the first item, what regulations in particular are being considered for streamlining or replacement and what are the priority areas that merit review, in your opinion? And does this include a uh, pattern of violations? The, firstly, on the dust issue, you know, the, the 2014 regulation, uh, the preamble to the 2014 regulation required a retrospective study to begin in 2017. Uh, because of some reasons that did not begin in 2017. So we are undertaking that retrospective review beginning in 2018. As far as what regulations are specifically under consideration, 
We have not uh, received comments at this point in time that would lead us to put any under reconsideration. Indeed, the 1.5 milligram standard uh, is not something that I would put under consideration. The monitoring, the personal dust monitors, uh, I think was the biggest concern about streamlining and about those things. The personal dust monitors seem to have be working very effectively. Uh, they've been accepted by the mine workers, they've been accepted by the mine operators, and they're doing their job. I think people really value getting instantaneous feedback on those items. Okay, so you said you didn't, you hadn't received any feedback that would... We, we have not yet received any feedback, ma'am. Okay. So with regards to the retrospective review uh, of the uh, respirable dust rule, what is uh, MSHA's plan of action? Uh, and um, the administration's regulatory agenda labels uh, MSHA's review as deregulatory, but you testified uh, today that you do not plan on changing the rule. So how do you square these two stances? You're, you're asking me why yes. it was labeled as deregulatory? Yes, and then since you testified that you don't, you're not going to change it, how do you... I don't think there's any evidence indicating that it should be changed one way or the other. I mean, understand that we partner regularly with MSHA or with NIOSH on this between NIOSH and MSHA. We have, I have met already once with NIOSH. They talk to us about their studies and what they're finding. Uh, we have the National Academy of Sciences uh, report that's due out in March or April of this year to Congress. Uh, I think that should really be able to provide the most guidance. I, I can't tell you why it was listed as a deregulatory item unless it has something to do with the frequency of the PDM sampling, ma'am. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Adams. The Chair now recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Rooney, for five minutes. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. The first thing I'd like to uh, make a comment that if you really want to get rid of coal dust, go to natural gas. It's cleaner, it's cheaper, and you don't have all these injuries. But till that day happens, which is rapidly, uh, uh, rapidly approaching us, uh, we all feel here that Obama's uh, administration's complicated and burdensome regulations have been a major burden on our society and our business. And I wonder uh, what MSHA can do to turn this thing around and get back to more uh, efficient and workable regulations in your area. All right, thank you, sir. Uh, coal is used for more than just power generation, by the way. It also has other uses throughout the steel making world and other specialty chemicals. Uh, what we can do is to make sure that we have less accidents, less incidents. I have operated a number of mines throughout my life, and I can tell you that my most profitable operations were always my safest operations. Safety is not something that will be shortcut, and if you think you're going to make money being unsafe, you're just kidding yourself. That's so, certainly I mean, been what, my experience. What we can do is just make sure that people are doing the right things, because accidents are really something happened that you didn't intend to happen. And your business, your processes will never be in control as long as you're having those kind of exceptions and people getting injured, sir. That's always been my experience in construction as well. I appreciate that. One more question right quick is, uh, you know, the uh, Trump administration and the Republican conference's efforts to stimulate job growth have proven out to be very effective so far this year, and uh, including the deregulatory agenda. Some $8 billion of burden on American business has been removed. I just wonder what can MSHA do to uh, help move that ball forward? Sir, we have a working group on that very subject. Uh, we have taken uh, input, email input, and website input from different groups that have specific suggestions about where our regulations can be updated. Some of our regulations are uh, refer even clear back to the 1966 electrical code. Some of these need to be updated and brought more current. Uh, to the extent that we can update those and bring in newer technologies, I think that will be a benefit. 
the the uh, deregulatory agenda, and, and I have read most of them that have been submitted so far, goes through a working group at MSHA, and I'm sure that in very soon we'll be able to compile something that is a good synopsis of where we're at with that. Thank you. That's very encouraging. I yield. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rooney. The chair now calls or recognize the gentlewoman from New Hampshire, Ms. Shea Porter, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And thank you, Assistant Secretary Zatazello, for being here today. I was heartened when I read in your testimony that you believe that there's nothing more important than ensuring that all minors go home safely to their families at the end of every shift. I agree with you. I was a member of this committee in 2010, and I will never forget traveling to Beckley, West Virginia, following the explosion at the Upper Big Branch Mine, a coal dust explosion, as you know, that killed 29 miners and injured two others. At this field hearing, we heard from the families of those who had lost loved ones in the explosion and from an Upper Big Branch miner who was 300 feet into the mine's entrance the day of the explosion and recalled the sensation of, and I quote, his feet wanting to leave the ground due to the force of the explosion as he tried to make his way to the exit. And let me say that uh, there was sobbing throughout this testimony not just by those who had been victimized by losing a loved one, but also by members of the committee. It was incredibly painful to be part of. It took quite a lot of bravery for those witnesses to testify before the committee that day, and it was heartbreaking to hear consistently that the miners and their families knew that the mine was unsafe, but feared the loss of their jobs if they dared speak up. I want to read briefly from the testimony of Stanley Goose Stewart, the coal miner who was 300 feet underground at the time of the explosion. This is what he told the committee, and I quote, outlaw companies need to be put on pattern of violations easier than existing law allows. Protesting violations should not hide the violations and should not keep them from being put on pattern. Something is wrong when not one pattern of violation has been issued since the law was created in 1977. Following this tragedy, MSHA, in response to recommendations made by the Inspector General, reformed the POV rule, which was finalized in 2013. Shifting gears slightly, Mr. Bob Murray, the CEO of Murray Energy, wrote to Vice President Pence last year calling for the Trump administration to nullify the POV rule. Are you aware of that? I've heard that, yes, ma'am. Okay, I have his letter if you would like to see what he wrote to the Vice President. And as I mentioned, this POV rule was adopted under the previous administration in response to recommendations by the IG. He has also sued to invalidate the rule. So here's my question. Has the POV rule been effective in reducing the number of mines which have a pattern of significant and serious violations? How many mines qualified for that designation last year? Ma'am, the POV rule, since it has been implemented, uh, resulted in a few operations being placed on it initially. Uh, it, we review those every year, MSHA reviews those, and for the past three years there have been no new people that have qualified for that. We have currently one operation that remains on POV status. Uh, so has it done its job, you asked? Uh, it, it seems that it has been a deterrent against new people getting on, certainly. And I mean, the, the same people that reviewed it in the beginning are the people that have reviewed it for the past three years. And for the past three years, there have been none, no new people that qualified for it. Okay, so deterrence a good thing. So do you agree, Mr. Murray, that the POV rules should be overturned, as he asserts in his letter to the Vice President? I think that uh, Mr. Murray is entitled to his opinion, and I think that the judiciary and the suit that he files would probably preclude me from saying anything further about that. I think that uh, I think the regulation has been effective. It has been able to reduce repeat violators. I thank you for saying that. Do you agree, Mr. Stewart, that something went wrong when not one mine had been placed on POV under the old rule? 
Do I agree that the previous rule was with ineffective? The minor, right. The, but the previous rule was not, had not ever implemented, ma'am. Right. So you agree that something was wrong when it had never been implemented. I know that you know how they avoided having that implemented. Yes, ma'am. Right. Okay. So I just want to thank you for, for the acknowledgement there and I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Shapor. The chair now calls on the gentleman from West Point, Georgia, Mr. Ferguson, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Secretary. Thank you for being here. Uh, recently, President Trump, in his State of the Union address, had indicated and made the declaration that he had ended the, the war on clean coal. Um, the industry still faces a significant number of challenges. Um, Tell me what you think some of those challenges are and what can be done to help, uh, help address some of those challenges. Well, the first challenge is also always on safety. Uh, what we can do to help that, you know, last year we had too many people killed and injured throughout the mines. So safety is always a challenge on that. Uh, what, what I believe the president was speaking to mostly are environmental rules and regulations, uh, Generally, we don't get involved in that, sir. Okay, thank you. You also mentioned in your testimony that the agency is going to be rolling out a modernized inspection application system. Yes, sir. Um, can you expand on this and talk about how that will impact mines and small businesses? It will allow inspectors to A, communicate the problems they find faster and better, and B, it will give them superior information because they will have access to mining plans that are approved specifically for that mine. It will also give them access to general guidance and, and put more information at their fingertips for when they do find something that they're not sure of. So hopefully it will allow them to answer their questions before they take actions. Gotcha. Um, also in your testimony, you mentioned that 43% of the fatalities in 20 um, 17 involved the haulage. Um, what are you doing to raise awareness about this and, and, and discuss this particular issue? And then, and then work, and then also how are you then working with um, smaller operators and haulers to make sure that this, that this number goes down? I've talked at, uh, at one mining symposium so far since I've been here and gave one other safety talk. That was the top item on my list these powered haulage, we have incidents still in this world where we have larger vehicles running over smaller vehicles and occasionally killing people in them. This is, this is something that in the days of autonomous driven vehicles that we should be able to correct. And uh, it's not a heavy lift to correct some of these. It is something that we are trying right now to uh, enlist the industry in their support of eliminating these, and it's not in anybody's best interest that these continue. Uh, we're also going to be doing a request for information with various manufacturers of this heavy equipment so that we can find out exactly what systems are available and which ones are the best that are available and, and make sure that these get adopted throughout the industry. Nobody wants these accidents to continue. We've also had some incidents where uh, at least two and perhaps three where seat belts were not in use that would have saved life. And even on something as big and tough as a bulldozer or a 300 ton hauling truck, those seat belts can actually save lives. And so it's getting the message out there. We're doing that with our own talks, with our own compliance assistance program. We're gonna be doing it through a request for information to the heavy equipment manufacturers also, sir. Oh, and Mr. Secretary, let me say how much we appreciate your dedication to that. Um, one of the things that I hope that you will be um, considering as that goes through is to include in those conversations the smaller, um, the smaller operators. One of the things that we see so many times is that the rules and regulations with good intentions that are placed on very large industries that have a tremendous impact on, on small businesses and compliance costs. Um, not to say that we don't need to figure out smart ways of doing this, but let's please recognize the differences between these very large corporations and these smaller companies that are in many of our communities. 
Um, so I just want to say thank you for your dedication to that, and please be open to recognizing the differences between those two. Absolutely, Congressman. Thank you, Mr. Foreman. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Ferguson. It appears to be we have no further members here to ask questions, so this concludes your te testimony. We appreciate that. Mr. Connell, do you have any closing remarks? Yes, Mr. Chairman, only that I'd like to uh, ask unanimous consent to enter into the record uh, uh, seven documents. Uh, here, uh, Mr. Scott, uh, Mr. Scott's letter to, uh, and Mr. Casey's letter to NIOSH, HRSA, and, and DOL. Uh, an additional letter to NIOSH and HRSA, uh, the response to the Scott Casey letter, uh, the chart of outstanding uh, MSHA fine debt, uh, the 2013 and 14 annual reports for the Coal, Kentucky Coal Association, uh, number five, innovative exposure uh, monitoring approach, the end of shift silica monitoring for coal mines, uh, also uh, two PowerPoint slides on, uh, on PMF and Lastly, the JAMA PMF study. Without objection, so ordered. And uh, that concludes. Um, do you have a closing statement? Do you have a closing statement? Or, or do you have a closing statement? Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, I, I do uh, want to thank the Assistant Secretary for uh, testifying before the subcommittee today. As I mentioned in my opening remarks, it has been nearly two and a half years since we held our last hearing on mine safety. Mr. Chairman, based on the new report released today, I think it is time to hold a hearing on, black lung, on the Black Lung Benefits Act, which has not received a hearing in this committee since, the 1991, since 1991, which is 27 years ago. Hearings would be especially valuable and timely since the excise tax rate on mined coal that was authorized by Congress and used to fund the Black Lung Benefits Disability Trust uh, Fund, Trust Fund sunsets at the end of 2018 and it is extremely important that we ensure this fund remains solvent. The trust fund pays benefits to certain coal miners when no coal miner is identified as responsible for paying the miners benefits, or if the operator is not financially capable of doing so. The current tax rate of $1.10 per ton for underground mine coal and 55 cents per ton for surface mine coal will be cut by 55%, which will substantially threaten trust fund's future. During today's hearing, we learned two things. The most advanced form of black lung disease is surging among miners to levels not seen since the 1970s, and important worker protections such as MSHA's pattern of violations rule, which has dramatically reduced the number of mines with excessive, significant, and serious violations, needs to be preserved. And I'm happy to hear the Secretary's response uh, to Ms. Uh, Shea Porter's questions. We, we believe that we have further opportunities to continue legislation that would strengthen worker, protection, worker protections and MSHA's enforcement tools. In particular, H.R. 1903, the Robert C. Byrd Mine Safety Act of 2017 would make key reforms to help MSHA hold accountable the minority of mine operators who put production ahead of workers' safety better enable MSHA to collect fines from mine operators and authorize MSHA to have basic investigative tools such as subpoena power. I look forward to continuing this conversation and finding opportunities to assist the Mine Safety and Health Administration's efforts to protect miners across our nation. Thank you, and I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Takano. Mr. Secretary, thank you for being here today. We appreciate all of your testimony, your commitment to your job, you are completely genuine and sincere in all of your remarks. That was readily uh, evident in the way you responded. This committee wants to work with you to make sure that we help you do your job. Because everybody on this committee, want, every last person, wants to do everything that we can working with the law to make sure that we provide for the safety of our coal mines, whether it's to prevent deaths or to prevent the incidence of black lung disease. So we can count on you and your staff to keep us informed. Uh, with that, there being no further business, the subcommittee stands adjourned. Thank you, sir.